how could the artist's imagination help make issues more accessible to people? To recognize artists as not just the icing on the cake, the thing that is always disposed of first, but really essential members of a conversation. Mary, we're connecting with you here in your studio in Tribeca. When did you move in here? I moved in in 1970. I lived around the corner in an old herring factory. When we moved in down here, there were spice and coffee and cheese companies all over. Uh, there was a butter company across the street. Uh, there were uh, cheese fumes not always nicely coming in our back window. It's completely transformed around yeah. here. Do you yes. feel like you had any say no. in that? No, I did not have any <laughs> say. I do not know where I, where I live anymore. I can't get down the street because there are so many baby carriages. It's a totally different place. Were you always driven by this sense of how do you reconnect a people to its place? Was that a driving influence for you? It was really important and I think that's what ended up separating me and my work early on from the land artists because they were willing to go out in the desert and build something. And what really interested me was more about what a person experiences and how you engage people with places and structures and their own environment. We call ourselves a laboratory, City is Living Laboratory, because we're interested in testing how you engage people. So that's what got us out walking the corridor of Broadway. 5.5 million people per day ride the subway. It's the largest shared urban infrastructure. This is Red Square. It's an apartment building that was um, built at the fall of communism. The estimate's one to 10 birds per die a year uh, per building and there's about a million buildings in New York City. So we started doing walks with artists and scientists and every one of these green tags represents an artist-scientist walk or talk that has happened. So we've done almost 50 of these. So we've really been investigating the whole corridor, but now our attention is really focusing up here on uh, Van Cortlandt Park, starting at Van Cortlandt Park and going down to the Harlem River. This is really an interesting project. Every time it rains, even a little bit, this area floods all along Broadway. The basements flood, people's uh, businesses flood. And part of that is happening because there's a brook called Tippett's Brook that comes into Van Cortlandt Lake. It's from a watershed that goes up into Westchester County. And in the early teens of the 20th century, the water was put into the sewer, the Broadway sewer. So the sewer line goes under Broadway, cuts across, and finally goes into the Harlem River. But there are about four to five million gallons of water a day that go into the sewer. So it ends up going in as sewage into the Harlem River. And it's one of the worst polluters of the Harlem River. So people have talked for a long time about how it might be possible to daylight Tibbetts Brook, and that means letting it see the light of day, taking it out of the sewer. So the Friends are a nonprofit organization that does environmental education and stewardship programs in Van Cortlandt Park. The Friends and other groups have been talking about daylighting Tibbetts Brook for a while, and we have a coalition. For me personally, it was looking at where the brook goes into the sewer and kind of going, questioning, like, wait, where does this water go? and why is this clean water going into the city sewer system? You don't think about what happens when I take a shower, what happens when I flush a toilet to that water. You just know the city takes care of it and all's good on your end. But unfortunately, the city's not taking care of all of it. Parks Department has been on board with daylighting for many, many years now. Uh, we are slowly getting DEP to be on board. And the main issue for them has always been, well, the city doesn't own the property, so it probably can't happen. 
but the solutions that they've come up for dealing with this are absolutely horrible. They're horrendous. It's like, oh, we'll just build these huge catch basins at the northern end of the park and they can hold the water. And it's like, well, no, those are forests. You're not going to take down our trees and just put in concrete basins to hold water. That's not a good solution. Oh, we'll change the level of the lake. We'll, you know, increase, we'll decrease the depth of the lake. Well, then you're opening up all the shorelines for Phragmites and other invasives. Not a good solution. You need to come up with a good solution. And daylighting is is the only good solution for the environment as a whole. So we don't have to feel limited when we imagine what the daylighting of Tibbetts Creek can be, because we know they may have, right, they may have built it over the river. It doesn't mean it can't reemerge. As the city as a living lab has been really great as, as far as getting the word out about the project, getting more people informed. We have our limited reach and our focus has really been on the environmental aspects of it. The more people that are aware of it, it will help right, raise it to a level of priority for the city to do, then we can show that more people support it and this is what everybody wants. We're imagining that there could be a sound wall between the highway and the corridor itself and that there could be an elevated pathway and then that the stream could run down that corridor. People could actually have access to nature and not just a highway. So one of the things that we're doing yep. is trying to find ways to draw attention. One of our most interesting projects was an artist named Bob Brain, who did temporary tattoos that he hand painted onto people. People would line up, they could not wait to have this done. Are they tracing the track of Tibbetts Brook? Yes, yeah, so it's showing the original track, which you can see here. Here's what it used to be. Now it's in the Broadway sewer, and here's where we want it to be along the, uh, you know, Major Deacon. Like we were proposing this as one of our projects, and one of our board members said, isn't that a little weird? Actually, it turned out to be the, like the most impactful thing that we've done as a project, pro practically. The impulse behind this came out of my decades of working in the public realm, because that's where all my work has been done. But it's really difficult to have access. And I wanted to try to imagine a way that artists would be recognized as being able to have an essential complementary role at the table when issues come up in the city. And what difference do artists make in those conversations? I think it's really about the kind of emotional, uh, sensual, psychological uh, aspects of art that give people something to relate to. I, I'm imagining that this corridor of Broadway that I'm looking at now and have been for a number of years, that in another 20 or 30 years it could be really transformed. This could become the corridor that looks at different social structures, different ecological structures, where it's, it's this rich environment instead of one that's just kind of a, a drain on uh, the people who live nearby in their busy lives where they're every, all of us are just running all the time. How do you begin to let their lives echo around them? For people that have come to New York, they might be familiar with one of the pieces that really has changed our landscape, and that's down at the, in Battery Park, um, South Cove. Can you tell us what your project was, what the idea was, what was the problem you were trying to solve there? Oh, the problem was that I'd been living in this neighborhood by the river since 1970, and we couldn't get to the river. So I wanted to do something that would really give people the water, that you would hear it, that you would smell it, that you would get down close to it. So we, you know, made it so that the walkway uh, ramps down, uh, that uh, there's a visual connection between the land and the water because I had these pilings put in that are reminiscent in a way of the old pilings that used to be there. We did this planting of what you might have found along the edge of the river in an, at an earlier period. Since it's nearby, I go regularly and I get to see the change of seasons there. And I get to see the way people interact with it. It's not to say, oh, look at this, look at me, I'm, I'm influencing everything. It's more to say, 
Yes, artists can really have an, an important role, which is the thing that got me to start City is Living Lab.